All right, thank you so very much for tuning in today. I have a very, very special guest with me, and it's Kenneth Bozeman. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Yes, I, I, it's such a pleasure and an honor to officially meet you. We've, um, we've interacted a little bit in some of the common Facebook circles that we're involved wow. with, or singing teachers sort of talk amongst themselves and such, but this is the first time that we've officially met face-to-face. -face. Right. And I want to let you know that I very, very much appreciate your taking the time out of your busy schedule to help us talk about this subject of formants and formant tuning and vowel modification and, and Pasaji events as well. Glad to do it. It's, it's my current mission in life. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, I know in, um, in practical vocal acoustics, you mentioned that you're not a scientist, that well, you're a teacher. But um, most other singing teachers at this point kind of regard you as an expert in this area. And you have spoken internationally at a number of voice science conferences and, and such. So I think, I think you're regarded pretty highly in this area of the profession. Thank you. Yeah, so and for those of you who don't know who Ken Bozeman is, he's a professor and also the chair, you're, you sit on the chair, the, the director of the voice vocal department. pedagogy and voice department, right? Mm -hmm. um, so and you teach um, singing and also vocal pedagogy at Lawrence University in Wisconsin. Right. Right. And uh, so how I came to know who you are um, is actually from your writings in the National Association of Teachers of Singing has um, the Journal of Singing. And um, so I was reading your articles um, from that, and that's how I became familiar with your work. And so you've published a number of articles in the Journal of Singing, and also you've published a couple books. So you have uh, Practical Vocal Acoustics, and also this year you published Kinesthetic Voice Pedagogy. And I will put the links to those um, um, to the website, to your website, as well as to, you know let people know where you can they can purchase those books if you like. Um, I do have to confess that, so because I was following your your writing in um, the Journal of Singing, and when I found out that you were publishing Practical Vocal Acoustics, I pre-ordered it, and the day that that book came in the mail, I was so giddy. I was like a child on Christmas morning who had just been given a puppy, and I was like in nerd heaven, and I was so excited to read this book. And um, it was, it's, it's a really, really good book. And you have a great knack for taking these really complex and sort of abstract concepts and making them a little bit more accessible, I think, to the average singer who isn't an academic, but more of an artist. So you have a great knack for that. So um, I, I, especially, I especially love practical vocal acoustics. I think there is some um, really great information, some practical stuff in there that... Yeah. Um, you know, viewers would really appreciate. Well, it's kind of been my mission, this the last part of my teaching career. I've taught here for 40 years, but it's uh, in my own work, I'm primarily a teacher. My primary interest is what goes on in the studio. Um, are you ready to go on? Um, so my, my goal is to go between the voice science information and the teachers to try to give them different things, and uh, they can go further with the science if they want to, but they uh, don't have to. Right. Yes, yeah, so that's actually why I asked you here today, because um, because this is an area of expertise for you, also a passion for you. Right. And I know that a lot of my readers have really been asking a lot of questions about formants, what they are, and how do you tune formants, and why do we tune formants, and what does it mean, and vowel modification has come up repeatedly, and in a recent video that I published, um, I actually quoted from Practical Vocal Acoustics with your definitions of passive vowel modification and active vowel modification, and trying to um, get to the point where my viewers can sort of wrap their minds around this concept, because it does seem rather abstract and sort of kind of out there. And um, so I, I asked you to come in because this is, this is your area of expertise, and I think that hearing it from you will be really, really beneficial. Good. Well, let me start. And first of all, my apologies for my cold. I may cough somewhere in the chat. Um, <clears throat> yes, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Despite being sick. <laughs> so, the vocal tract is a, is a tube. It's closed at one end and open at the other end. And that tube has a natural, a natural pitch to it that is its lowest resonance. And if I do this, 
you can hear about a G4 is the lowest resonance of this tube when one end is closed. That says first formant. And it has higher resonances as well. And those are just frequency peaks at which the tube will vibrate and it get excited. And in between those frequency peaks, it suppresses any acoustic information you put into it. The tube itself doesn't make any sound. The vocal tract doesn't make any sound. We input sound from the voice source, a set of harmonics, and then the tube selectively resonates some of those harmonics and suppresses other ones before it comes out the other end. So formants are natural resonances of the vocal tract. Um, <clears throat> they're tuned by the overall length of the tube. Like if I make this tube longer, it will be a lower pitch. So the, it, the overall length of the tube is very important in tuning where the various, the whole set of formants sits. So basically, uh, and that actually is huge in determining the vo vocal category or type. Right. So well, and both the, the, the internal dimensions other than length as well. I mean, width plays a role. Actually, the, actually the width is less uh, determinative of where the whole set sits. And that's because sound travels linearly and it's a question of the sound wavelength, not so much this as that. It has some effect, but it's mostly the length. So the longer the length of the tube, the lower the voice type, the shorter the length of the tube, and that would be from wherever your glottis sits to your lips would be the tube length, the higher the voice type. And of course, there's all kinds of uh, crossovers. There might be someone whose voice range is baritonal, but whose tube length is bass-like. So they might have a, a baritone range with a bass timbre or vice versa. They might have a, a bass timbre, a long tube and a baritone range. And those would be like a, you know, held in tenors, basically a baritone with a higher range. Uh, you know, those, those sense of overlaps. But in general, the thing that determines the overall quality of your uh, uh, timbre of your voice in terms of its depth factor is tube length. Um, anyway, then uh, there are harmonics, as I mentioned. The vocal folds or the voice source modulates the air. It, con it converts a, what you could call a DC flow of air, a direct flow of air, into an acoustic signal. And we actually want in classical singing, which is my specialty, uh, I'm asked to comment often on CCM styles, and I'll venture opinions, but I'll always qualify them with the comment that I'm not a specialist. But in classical, we want a clean signal almost all the time. Some styles don't want a clean signal all the time, but we do. So we want all of that airflow converted into harmonics at the voice source. And then that set of harmonics is the raw material out of which we then form the rest of our sound. So we input a set of harmonics into one end of this tube. It selectively resonates those harmonics and sends out into the world the final product out there. I'm going to quickly share a screen to show you how that works. Then, then those harmonics interact with those resonances. I'm going to quickly show you something here. Just a moment. I can find it. Okay. Must be this. Are you seeing this power spectrum of the vocal track? I am, yes. Wonderful. This is on my website, kenbozeman.com. All this is free access. And this, so this is a, an outline of the resonance characteristics of a bass voice singing an ah vowel. Uh, you see the frequency is on the, the horizontal scale here. <clears throat> and power or intensity is on the vertical. So this bass has a resonance about here, his first resonance or first formant is about there, and then the second formant there. You can use this slider here and input a set of harmonics like this. All right, so as I raise the pitch, it tells you the, the hertz of the pitch down here. So right now, let's see, this is about middle C, right about here. <clears throat> In that case, the bass has two harmonics below the first resonance. There's his third harmonic, his fourth harmonic, and so forth. 
And so as, as he raises the pitch, notice the harmonics, which are all multiples of the first harmonic, they spread out more as multiples would. So as I raise the pitch, the harmonics get further and further separated and their interactions with the formants changes. Every, all the way along the way, each of those changes will make a usually minute change in the sound quality, but sometimes a rather major change. And we'll be talking about that. The main one for male voices is when this second harmonic that's currently right smack in the middle of that first format there, when it rises through that first format, that's where the voice turns over. Historically, we call that cover. Uh, but cover covers a, a variety of activities that people do. This would be a very passive covering, not an active covering. But when the second harmonic rises above that first resonance, that timbre will shift a little more dramatically. What the women are typically doing is there's, as they sing higher in their range, they sing high enough that they can actually sing the pitch of their first formants, of all of their vowels. So right now, I have the, the first harmonic tuned right in the first formant. And when you do that, you get a very full, heady sound that we call whoop timbre. When people go to sporting events, they woo hoo that's whooping. And so basically, classical female singing is very advanced aesthetic whooping, pretty yeah. much. What pitch approximately is that? You have it at 630. 638. That's very high, actually. <clears throat> but it's about that particular, because this is a bass voice set up. That's at about E above middle C. I believe uh, 220, 330. So I, um, I think about, oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's actually higher than that. The, uh, the, uh, the 500 is... is uh, it's the it's the it's the the the, the e above, it's e five, e above uh, the, uh, an octave and a third above, middle C. <clears throat> I have to rethink those every now and then. So C five is is about here, at about you know, five thirty something, and then so that'd be you know six. Six sixty I think would be that e. So it's very close to that. D, D sharp, D, something like that. A bass ah form is usually around a D, around a D5. Um, anyway, so this, you can play with this and sort of see how they interact. Now, since I'm not changing the curve of this, this uh, transfer characteristic, that means this bass is not changing the shape of his throat or his mouth or anything at all. Normally, we, we make shape changes for various reasons, but in this particular model, I, I can't do that. But it shows you that if he doesn't make a change, sometimes things aren't being very well resonated because he's in the valleys rather than in the peaks. Well, and I guess, I guess that brings us to the topic of formant tuning. Yes. And understanding what that means. I don't know if you want to get back to full screen so we can see you a little bit better. Sure, sure. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's really fun. I love how it's interactive like that. So I have a little bit of a different take than some on formant tuning. Um, in lower voices, where you have a lot of harmonics painting in the resonances of the vocal track, you don't really need to do a lot of formant tuning un until you get rather high in the range, and even then, more on some vowels than on other vowels. And that's because you have plenty of harmonics that are close together, that are painting in all of those peaks and valleys <clears throat> for, your, for your listener. However, whenever a harmonic rises through that first resonance, that first format of the vocal track, you can hear it. it uh, not even just the second harmonic, the third harmonic and so forth. And you hear it as a little bit of a timbral closure. The Italians called that chiusa, voce chiusa, closed voice. And voce aperta is open voice. So open voice is basically when you have two or more harmonics below your first format. If this is your first format, uh, uh, the other thing I can show you with my own voice. That's the, 
you know, that would be my thumping on this tube and changing for different vowels, changing the shape of the tube to show the first form. It moves around quite a bit from vowel to vowel. If this is my first formant, if I'm singing a pitch more than an octave below it, then I have two harmonics, because the first two harmonics are an octave apart, two harmonics below that first formant. So anytime I'm singing more than an octave below my lowest resonance, I'm in open timbre. However, say I'm singing well below it. If I'm two octaves below it, I would have four harmonics below. That would be a really open timbre quite a buzzy sound. And every time a harmonic rises above that first format, the timbre will close a little bit and the vowel will seem to sound taller and maybe narrower without my changing the shape at all. Right. We didn't know that always. Uh, at least not, not everybody knew that. There are a few writers that in their earlier language tried to describe that phenomenon. But in the scientific era, for a, quite a while, we just assumed that the only way to modify a vowel was to change the shape of the tubing. Turns out that's not true. Every pitch change changes the vowel quality slightly. And especially pitch changes in which the harmonic rises above the first format, it'll change the vowel quality a little bit more than just a little bit. <clears throat> so those I call passive modifications or passive vowel migrations. I can't do much with my cough and cold, but I'll try to make a sound or two, <clears throat> not a, a, a finished sound for the stage. <clears throat> but if I take an O vowel and do this, oh, notice I'm trying my best to keep the shape exactly the same. And also notice that didn't stay an O that migrated somewhere. I do an ah, 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 ah. It takes on quite a bit of uh, ah, but I'm not shaping uh, ah. I'm shaping ah and changing pitch. Those are passive all migrations. Turns out, <clears throat> even if you're healthy, that isn't easy to do because it's not instinctive. The instinctive thing to do is to yell. And when we yell, we try to track that second harmonic by changing the shape of the vocal track. We go like this. Ah. We raise the larynx and widen the, the mouth. <clears throat> that is basically the strategy for yelling. In an aesthetic modified form, that is the strategy for some people for teaching belt, because belt is actually trying to imitate the uh, emotional quality of a yell. Because, you know, when we yell, we yell in circumstances of high drama and intensity. This is quite not a um, pejorative to say that belting is like yelling. Unless you do raw yelling, then it's not good for you. But, I mean, it's just because yelling is very emotional. But we learn to do it very carefully so that we don't abuse the vocal folds. So there's a, there's you know, strategies for doing that. <clears throat> but it's, it's imitative of the yell, and it even partakes of the yell strategy for a percentage of the time, and then it switches over to something that's just sort of imitative of a yell without being a yell. <clears throat> but anyway, that's what's going on with uh, interaction between harmonics and the first, first format. Right. Well, actually, in a recent video, I also demonstrated this concept of keeping the vocal tract as stable as I possibly can, um, and allowing that little turning over to happen, um, and just that passive modification to happen. And then also, I did the same thing where I'm like, I raised the first form and went into yeah. yell, and what happened was my O vowel modified to an ah. I wasn't yeah. thinking about it, but that's what I had to do to stay right. in that same right. resonance coupling. Right. And, um, you know, my demonstration, because I was being so focused on just keeping keeping a stabilization here. I mean, it wasn't a pretty turning over of the vowel and it wasn't intended to be for that demonstration. It was, this is what happens. It forces an acoustical shift, a timbral adjustment. Right. And understanding that I think is, is really important. I was working with a, a male student today, um, a baritone, and we're working on exactly this, learning to acoustically close off the voice. Um, this is what Jake Yuza, 
And, you know, and he kept noting, he's like, wow, it just, just sounds different. I'm like, yeah, but it sounds a little bit more different, I think, to you than even to me. It's, right. it's not as drastic. And I think over time, as we continue to improve the information, <laughs> that, that, you know, turning over point is going to be a little bit less obvious to the yes. listener. And it smooths out and stuff. I've been focusing on this specific topic on my Patreon page. Same thing. Just um, learning to be able to recognize the sound of that, that closing off of the voice, the acoustical closing off. And, and you do want uh, it, the, some of the challenges is, aside from the fact that it's not instinctive, the instinct is to yell. And then if you tell someone, no, don't change the shape, the instinct is to kind of lock onto something and hold and inhibit. And so you've got to be creative as a teacher to find ways to motivate the sound production that neither results in a fixing or a dampening or a, 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 a trapping or boxing in of the sound, but allows the, the migration to happen. And in my work, <clears throat> increasingly, I have gone toward the use of affect. Uh, because since voicing, anyway, originally, and forever and a day is about um, expressing feeling. Babies voice immediately, and they're not talking language. They're not even thinking about vowels. They're expressing feelings. Now, of course, any sound you make has vowel content, because if you've uh, kept up with Ian Howell's work, you know that sound, humans interpret sound frequencies as vowel-like timbres and mixtures of vowel-like timbres. And so any sound we hear as humans is either an identifiable vowel or it's made up of a, a cluster of vowel-like sounds that are maybe too confused for us to hear a single vowel out of it. But it's all vowel-like. So babies are making vowels, even though they're not thinking vowels, they're thinking feelings. So if I don't chase the vowel, but I, I suggest a vowel to myself, and then I suggest the vowel, but I insist on the feeling. So if I say, yeah, yeah, and just track the expressive path that the feeling motivates. And by the way, expression, affect, communication determines pretty much everything. It determines the pitch. It determines the pitch path. Melodic, you know, melody is really just choreography for expression. And when we speak, we speak with melodic inflection, and we don't plan it. The expression creates the melody of the inflection. So if I concentrate on the, the affective expression, and like you were saying, I reverse engineer, if I've got a, a melody to sing, I think, okay, now what expression would have yielded that particular melodic curve? If I can motivate that feeling, the thing will work a lot better on its own. And so that will help stabilize the the shape without my fixing or without any rigidity. It's a more supple way of stabilizing things. And I don't chase the vowel. The other thing that helps immensely uh, is also uh, picking up on Ian's work and, and my adaptation of it is realizing that vowels are made up of two vowel qualities. There's an over vowel quality and there's an under vowel quality. And the higher you go, the more the singer will perceive the under vowel quality through the same shape. Wait, the, you sir, explaining a little bit more about the under and over concept? No. So the under vowel is the vowel quality that is being resonated by the, the lowest resonance of the voice. The over vowel is the vowel quality present in the harmonics or harmonic being resonated by the second formant or second resonance of the voice. So, for example, when I do it, I'll see if I can, I don't know if you'll hear this or not, it'll be a whisper, but I'm going to whisper You'll hear my second form of pitch, I hope. I'm going to do E, A, E. Are you hearing? Can you hear that over the internet? I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not. My hearing is not. That's the over vowel. The under vowel is that. So we're actually making the, the, the composite vowel out of two different vowel qualities. Notice in an ah vowel, when I do ah, ah, and I thump the under vowel, 
that doesn't sound quite like ah. It sounds sort of like ah. Uh. Right. If I try to make that sound like an ah, uh, you will you will recognize what I'm doing. I raised my larynx. I'm not depressing my larynx. It's just ah uh, ah. Uh, Ah, ah. So the under vowel quality is in there, even though I'm not shaping that vowel. It's inherent in an open throat and a settled larynx. And I was going to say that too, that there are some teachers who do teach that all the vowels sort of migrate toward a, sort of an uh kind of quality or uh right. in the higher range. Right. And I find that I don't actively teach it, don't shade your vowel intentionally or actively toward ah or uh, but if you do stabilize the length of the vocal tract to some mm. extent, the vowel starts to adopt that sort of uh-ishness or mm. uh-ishness, depending yes. on where you are and depending on the singer. And so sometimes just, some people do better with more of an active approach to vowel modification, right. but in general, mm. if we do stabilize it, you can hear, you can hear that little shading of the vowel toward this more neutral quality. And that's really, to me, it just says it's a sort of neutrality in here where yes. it's stabilized and we're not making radical adjustments in the pharyngeal cavity right. or the vowel. That's right. So I'm not too hard on the active vowel modifiers. <clears throat> uh, I don't do it. Uh, well, I, the, we do active vowel modification in very particular circumstances, but quite a bit of the range, particularly for, for non-treble voices, males other than countertenors, is passive. And even for the women below the first formant pitch, you can completely do it with passive modification, no shape change. As soon as you get above the first formant of your whatever vowel you're on, you need to start actively modifying treble voices. Uh, men can't sing as high as the first formant of most of their vowels. Uh, they can sing as high as their E formant and their U formant and some other vowels like U. E, E, U, E, those are low. But ah, uh, it's not an octave higher. I can't sing as high as my ah uh formant. So I never have to modify my ah, uh, actually. So, <clears throat> uh, but I'm not hard on the active modifiers because they correctly heard that the sound needed more of that under vowel quality in it. But they, in my opinion, mistakenly naively at that time because we didn't know better really assumed you had to shape that the vowel of the under vowel quality so for example <clears throat> the under vowel of an e perceptually the under vowels of all vowels actually if you isolated them and heard them in isolation would be ooh or o oh. that's because the harmonics in that within the treble clef are ooh and o oh. and and all all the formants first formants are within the treble clef but we don't always perceive it as an O or an O because we tend to not hear it isolated. We tend to hear it blended a little bit with the over vowel. So an, an E sounds to us generally, unless we've trained our ears to hear it singly, and, and Ian works with that sometimes, but sounds like a capital Y if you know your IPA. Sounds mm -hmm. like E. So I'll show you this. I'll do this with, with a, another one. If you, do it, if you make the noise with your tongue hump, uh, in a K and do an E if you do sounds like an E that noise I'm, I'm playing the noise that you hear right here now I'm going to try to play the noise behind my tongue that sounds more like the capital Y mm -hmm. but notice I'm not doing that with my lips as I would if I were speaking German I'm doing so an E has E and E in it. E, E, E. If I only have the over vowel, I'll have a thin E. It'll be E, 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 high larynx. But if I have E, E, I keep my tongue hump high to make it a real E. Because if I drop my tongue hump, it won't be an E anymore. But I'm aware, I open the front of the mouth. And I bring in a little bit more of that quality. So I have E and E, 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 
uh, <clears throat> to, to blend those two sounds together. Well, that reminds me a little bit of something that Richard Miller always emphasized, was that the tongue always speaks the integrity of the vowel, the intended vowel. Yeah. If you keep the tongue, if you're, if you're singing an E, if that's what's the in the text that you're singing, if you're singing an E with your tongue, despite making some slight other adjustments, for example, like yeah. using a little bit of the lateral spread with the, the mouth and just kind of yeah. starting to sort of round a little bit more, that it will still retain some of the E-ishness about it. Right. Um, but yeah, you will adopt, it will adopt that sort of, we'll say, lower vowel kind of sound. Well, I was going to say earlier, too, that when singers are taught to kind of go into more of that uh, space, yeah. intentionally, actively, what often happens is they kind of have this sort of flat, dull singing. Yes. They, it, it, it becomes flat in intonation, but mm. also flat in terms of losing its its ring, its brilliance in the sound, and the vowels will sort of become uniformly distorted. Right. right. So, so I, um, I don't use what I call the front room, which I talk about in the second book, the back room, front room. <clears throat> I don't use the front room um, for darkening. Um, I think of the front room as all about letting it ring out. If you've got the throat open and the, the tallness in the back, you're getting all your warmth from that. You don't need to warm it in the front, which will compromise your addiction. <clears throat> now, that said, there certainly are varieties of things that one can do acoustically, and there's some people that sing quite wonderfully doing other approaches. And that's fine, they're making good money at that, and they're making wonderful art. You know, as teachers, we're always kind of shooting for what is your ideal. And my ideal is still uh, at least a qualified sing as you speak, which is to say it, it looks a lot like the sounds would look like in speech. The, the articulation is very similar, except when we go higher, we're opening more. Now we know acoustically, since we don't speak that high, it's going to have some differences from speech, but they don't have to be strange differences. <laughs> they can they can still look, my E can still look. And if I'm doing a high E, uh, you see that my tongue is high. And I'm also not doing this. It doesn't have to look like that. Some people do that in good sounds. But, but you, they're, 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 they know, they realize I need more of that color in the sound, and they're using the front room to add it, when all they need to do is just leave the larynx low and settled and the palate high, and they'll have that color in there. And so, you know, as a part of the, the, the whole, the, the final thing. <clears throat> well, so some of the things that I know we wanted to talk about today um, was the idea of formant tuning and what that means. Again, I've defined it in a previous video, but right. perhaps hearing it from you might kind of help to so, solidify that in their minds. Um, and, you know, how that relates to vowel modification. And the question, of course, is, well, how much of the science do we need to understand in order to make good you know, to exercise good pedagogical practices or, you know, to practically accomplish vowel modification, for example, through the passaggio area. Wow. How much of this do we really need to know the average singer out there? So if you don't mind just kind of touching a little bit on, about on, yeah, <coughs> formant tuning. Excuse me. I'm well, it's so bad that you're sick. If you, if you look at my uh, books, which are short, by the way, <laughs> I try to short and to the point though, but you've got, you know, you don't, you don't like really waste a lot of time just sort of I, getting into extraneous history and what have you. I don't do calculus equations. Uh, so the vocal acoustics are science based, science informed, but they're not in my view and certainly in the view of any scientist, they're not heavy duty science. And so they're, they're targeted at, well, what does the teacher really need to know? And so that, you know, I do feel like a teacher is benefited by knowing a little bit more than what the student or the singer would need to know <clears throat> about how it works and why. But you don't have to do heavy duty science, in my opinion, to understand, oh, I have a set of harmonics. Oh, I have a tube that, that likes certain frequencies more than other frequencies. The frequencies it likes we call formants, you know and it resonates those better, and the shape that I make with a tube, I can move those lowest two resonances around. Now, <clears throat> uh, so, you know, there's a certain level is useful, 
Then the, the practical level, which I start in the first book, then I go into further in the second book of what you do and how you use it. <clears throat> so how do I tune those resonances? When do I need to tune those resonances? Formant tuning to many people, I think, means trying to get a formant to match a harmonic. Because when a harmonic is in a formant, it's going to be louder. And, and that's, that's true to a certain extent. The question is, do singers do that all the time or not? In the case of passive modification, no. They just let harmonics move through formants. And there are enough harmonics so that enough harmonics will hit a formant or close enough to it that their voices are resonant. However, being about the, the musical staff for females, right? And treble voices, the higher you get, it's harder and harder to have a harmonic hit a formant. So the women, as soon as you're singing above the natural resonance of a vowel that you're on, you start formant tuning. And to me, it's mostly tuning your first formant to the fundamental frequency, to the pitch you're singing. However, there are circumstances in which we tune the second formant to a higher harmonic. Men do that uh, when their voice turns over. If they want a real stentorian, ringing, powerful note, they do that by tuning the second formant to the third or fourth harmonic, or possibly a higher harmonic to the singer's formant cluster. <clears throat> Women can do that in the middle voice, which is analogous to the male upper voice. Um, for To strengthen an ah that's weak, a woman might look for a second formant boost uh, of a higher harmonic. <clears throat> but then women tune the, sing the pitch they're singing to the first formant as soon as they get that high, and from there on up, they try to do that. So that's what you're doing. And so th then the question just becomes, well, how do you do that? And that may get more detail than we can get into in great detail here, but <clears throat> part of it is, well, backing up from formant tuning, uh, the first step to me is not changing the shape until it's time to change the shape. And I spend most of my training of young singers just on that part. So when, because the yell when do you feel it is time to change? Under what circumstances, acoustically or, or physiologically, is it the time to start making slight adjustments to the, the, the shape and size of the tube? As soon as you're at the first form or higher. Okay. So for the guys, that's, that's only an E and a new vowel. Because they can't sing a size the first form of the other vowels. Yeah. So <coughs> if, a, if you sing the pitch of the first form, and you have a nice, relaxed, or open tube, your sound will be very round, full, warm, and if you're okay with this, feminine or whatever you want to call that quality that, you know, we, we've associated that opulent soprano-like quality. Uh, if, if you want to call that feminine, it isn't necessarily that because men and women can do either sound, okay. But, you know, we associate it that way. <clears throat> well, males uh, are in opera other than countertenors don't use that quality that often. They don't want their e vowel to sound like a countertenor or a mezzo, and then have their a vowel on the same pitch sound like a tenor. They want their e vowel to sound like a tenor. They want it to be that ringier, rougher quality, rather than that creamier, smoother, um, heady quality, unless they're going for that, that effect. <clears throat> so what men do, they actively modify an E, say this is the, the first format of an E, and it turns over really low, and E turns over around about an F, below middle C, E, F, well, as they're approaching the pitch E above middle C, if they don't want it to sound heady, they start raising that form above the pitch they're singing, and that keeps it ringy. So how do you teach raising that first form? Because we can do it by leaning the vowel toward a vowel with the next highest first form frequency, or we can do it in number, with a number of different adjustments, such as lowering the jaw. And but we want, it, we want it to be an E vowel. Right. When, I sing, when I would sing Maria, I didn't want her to be Maria. I wanted to be Maria. Even on a high, uh, I think there's a high A, B flat A, Maria. I didn't want to be Maria. Re, re. 
what you do is you keep the tongue hump very high near the roof of the mouth and it will sound like a knee. Let me do that little whisper thing again and I'll show you. What I'm going to ask you to do is to see if you hear the noise of an E in all of these demonstrations. You should if I do it well. I'm not doing I can't, uh, uh, it will cease making a noise at the, at the tongue hump if I drop my tongue. <laughs> so in this particular exercise where I'm using the tongue hump to make the noise. But notice. It raises the first format to open my mouth more. Tongue hump stays high, mouth opens, mouth does not cover over. So a little jaw lowering. As I'm sorry? So a little bit of jaw lowering in essence, right? Opening. Oh yeah, the, the, the jaw is being lowered. Right. And As opposed it, to and shading the vowel, modifying it to an <clears throat> if, and then right. an a, and right. then an f. <clears throat> right, and women can do the same thing rather high, but eventually you get so high that you have to lower the tongue and lose the e vowel a little bit. Right. But, but you can do it probably to an a natural, a flat a natural, before you, you know, Depending, I could play you examples, uh, a, a very convincing E vowel, but the, vowel, the mouth is open enough that it has a round opulence rather than a stridency. Well, and if you me, have a sample readily available, we'd love to hear it. Let me find one. I will do that. Hold on. And I'd also love to hear maybe your take on an O vowel. I think the O is tricky for a lot of individuals going through that passaggio. Okay. A soprano that works with me demonstrating an E vowel. So you get the idea, um, you know, and some people will get to that point by suggesting sing more of an I. I don't go that route, but I don't object to it if it's working. Uh, but I hear, I hear a little bit of an I, but yeah. I think again, that's just because she's lost a little bit of the lateral spread that we typically have with E. <clears throat> the jaw has started to lower more. And so I think even with the tongue high, it still has an I-ishness about it. Yep, there's some I mixed in. But I guarantee you she's not thinking it. Because if she were thinking it, she would have lowered the tongue further. Yes. And she would have lost further, you know, from it. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that you do. Well, <clears throat> um, for other vowels, actually, the challenge is most of the time allowing the passive mi migration with no shape change. So, for example, women in the middle voice, all through the middle voice and on up, uh, can afford, as long as they're making a really good ah shape, they can sing something that sounds more or less like a happy ah uh, and then a happy uh, but not an uh or an uh shape. Right. <clears throat> so they'll do ah, 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 ah. Again, I apologize for my voice. <clears throat> and so for them, it's more a matter of allowing the migration to happen because they, it's an all on the page. They want to hear ah, and they want to fix it, and they don't realize if they sing a good, if they set a good set of harmonics through that shape, we'll get a, an ah that has a little bit of uh, uh mix with it, but we still accept it as an ah, especially if it looks like an ah, if they haven't made it look like an uh. uh the visual uh, perception factor also plays a role. And, and, I mean, I think that's both visual, but I think it's actual as well, because if you think of the, the, the piece that I want to keep in there is I want a sensation like this uh, acoustically in the sound rather than like this. If I do, oh, uh, 
oh, I want a, a convergent resonator shape and not one that goes that way. Right. <clears throat> if they go that way, if, if they droop, if they think I was supposed to have some uh, uh, and I'll go, oh, they get nothing. They get, you know, oh, uh, because they've drooped the ceiling. There's no height in the back. There's no up and over acoustic sensation. And again, it goes back to that sort of full lackluster and flat in intonation kind of yes. quality. Ugh, yes. ugh. It's not a pretty sound. It loses that ring. It loses personality. It loses a lot of things, which is very different from, you know, I think people are, that are afraid of that. The old Italian adage of uh, inhale through a smile, it opens your throat. I completely accept that. I think it's completely true. But the, the, with qualification, we think of a smile as just a lip thing. And I say, no, actually, the lips are very, very secondary to a smile. A smile is a pharyngeal thing because most affects tune the pharynx to play the sound you want to express. So if I'm, if I'm really smiling, it's more of a, an inner setup of my pharynx that also happens to shape my lips somewhat, but it's not about lip spreading. That's very secondary. Uh, I, I think we're, you know, we're taught to get that little smile up under the eyes. And even though it's not connected to the, the soft palate really via muscular attachment, I think it's really what it cues the brain in terms of the emotional response. I think the brain is like, and that's when it starts to get that smile posture inside the throat. Right. Because we're, we're just cueing the brain differently when we get that just pleasant expression. Not I, Right. I, I personally, to also to, to keep the body mappers happy and off my back, because uh, they, they point out that there's no physical connection. And they're right. But, but there is a psycho, psychological connection. I so, believe an emotional connection. But, but I don't do it outside in, though I realize that that is a possible route uh, psychologically to get there. I do it inside out. And I say, you know, if you can figure out how to get the right thing on the inside without the outside, fine. It's really hard to do that for me. If I'm feeling a smile on the inside, it just comes through and it accomplishes something on the face. But th that's, that's evidence. It's secondary evidence. It's not causal. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I agree with the body mappers on that. It's not causal. But I, but I don't. Some people feel like if you smile at all on the face, you're raising your larynx and closing your throat. And some people do that. And over-brightening. Well, if you do the facey smile, and you way out there, and, yeah, okay, kind of that, eh. To me, that's, a, cat. that's a fake emotion anyway. <laughs> you know, emotion is generally felt all through the core, not just in the front of the face. So I, I'm very much interested in the inside out, and, if, and it will affect the face, facial structures as well, but that's secondary. But if it isn't happening on the face, I always wonder, okay, what's going on? Are you doing it? In, you know, are you really doing an affect? Humans, when they have affect, you see it a little bit, at least. <clears throat> so. Very good. So um, I know we, we talked about trying to get into some of the practical, which I feel is that we have. We've talked a little bit about a couple of the vowels and right. do events for male and females and such. Is there anything else that you feel would be relevant or <clears throat> very, very much so. And this is parallel in men and women. Men are approaching this situation from about C to F, if it's a high voice male. C to F, lower for lower voice males. <clears throat> um, they're approaching where those vowels turn over. Where your O and your A turn over, your close O and close A, is for, say, a tenor would be about a C, C sharp. And the A turns over to about F, F sharp. Anyway. The other vowels? So, so O and A, uh, and this is all in the charts in my books. But oh. only, where, in other words, it's an octave below the first formative of the vowels. Basically, the first formative of an E and an O are at the bottom of the treble clef. An O and an A are somewhere near the middle of the treble clef, depending on the voice type. For really low voices, it might be as low as an A natural for basses. But for tenors, it's closer to C, C sharp. O and A. Then A uh, and A. Uh, for tenors, is it about E flat? And then A uh, is about F, F sharp. So that C to F area in high voices, male or female, is where a lot of stuff happens. For the men, it's where this is happening. For the women, it's where this is happening. This is the pitch you're singing. This is your second harmonic. 
men it's turning over, women it's going into whoop timbre. So as you're approaching that juncture, whether it's this one or this one, you will notice quite a bit of vowel mi migration. And the vowels will migrate toward the under vowel quality, <clears throat> which I have a chart for in, in the second book. And so you have to allow that. If you don't allow that, I can guarantee you, you're opening the vowel or, and or raising your larynx or both, and you're going to have trouble. So for women, so for, for, for men, an O will seem to go O, O. And so for women as well, when women approach C5 sopranos or, or countertenors, it will seem a lot like an O. The same shape will sound increasingly like an O. And so if you don't allow that to happen, and it will, all of a sudden, it will take on a domey kind of a quality when you let it happen. If it doesn't dome, if your O doesn't dome near C5, certainly no, no later than D5, you're cheating. <laughs> well, cheating. You're changing your vocal tract shape. Right. And, you don't, and you shouldn't because it's going to rob you of the real blossom of your upper voice. <clears throat> it happens on an E, uh, 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 O vowel there. It happens on an A vowel about there, maybe C, D area. And then on your E eh and your O, oh, it happens about on an E flat. And if it isn't happening, you're narrowing your pharynx and raising your larynx and opening your mouth. But if you leave it, so, so the, the vowel will migrate like that. The sensation, <coughs> the acoustic sensation will migrate <coughs> like that epsilon <coughs> that I've got in the book or something like that. It, it ceases to be so much just in your mouth and it's kind of, has a, it has a settling under and an up and over behind thing. So you'll have a kind of a, um, <clears throat> sorry, ya, or e, a, so a, a, kind of a sensation. Um, <clears throat> demonstrations are awful. I can play you an example of a tenor going doing an ah vowel through that area. To show you that, I'll share that screen. But let me. Great. Open up. <clears throat> I think it's. Uh, I'm not sure which one. There's several I've got here. Upper migration. Oh, this is the long one. This is a long one. Okay. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Can you see that screen now? Yes, we can. You hear that turn over a little bit there on the top note? Now notice he's not changing the shape. Turning over very, yeah. very clearly. So that's passive vowel modification. He doesn't change the shape of the, of the tube at all from top to bottom. And because he can't sing as high as his ah vowel, uh, first formant, so it just modifies itself. But he keeps a very deliberate ah uh, shape, but allows the vowel quality to migrate. So that was an example of that. That's great. So I did have a question for you, and I can't think if it was um, Marchese or um, Demereau who wrote this, that I, I know a discussion has arisen in um, our functional voice book club, <laughs> and a question of, you know, vocal registration and how the science is saying, well, there are only two registers, and those are more laryngeal registers, and I know that you're very passionate about there also being these acoustical shifts that take right. place and acoustical registration, we'll call it. Um, correct me if, if you don't like my, my nomenclature. <laughs> um, but so 
I, I can't remember again if it was Marchese or not, but she says, you know, that the, the female voice most clearly has a middle register. And when I was taught from my teacher in sort of a bel canto tradition, we were taught that there is a middle register. So even though it was in M2, in terms of its, we'll say, dominant, right. Right. there is most clearly, I feel and I hear the difference when I'm moving between my lower passaggio E4, as a mezzo, a lyric mezzo, and my upper passaggio E5. There is most clearly a difference in sensation, in quality, um, not better or worse, but quality. And there's most clearly stuff that goes on acoustically <laughs> and adjustments that I need to make starting a little below my upper passaggio, somewhere around C sharp or D, depending on the vowel, I need to start making adjustments. And I find myself going into that uh-ish kind of, we'll say lower vowel quality. Right. And I'm just wondering if you could just kind of weigh in on that, because I'm sure that a lot of my viewers, my female viewers are experiencing something very similar. And I'm sure that the changes have to do with passive vowel modification or whatever it might be. And the need for us to start lowering around that E, F, F sharps to start lowering the jaw. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, of course, I don't know where science will end up on this. Okay. Um, registers were defined at one point as segments of range that share a similar quality and that are made by the same mechanical principle. Now, most of them don't say the same laryngeal mechanical principle. They just say mechanical principle. But they meant laryngeal. That's what they were thinking. So they assumed that these timbral shifts that we hear were all caused by different laryngeal muscular adjustments. And actually, that's just not true. Uh, the larynx and the laryngeal adjustment certainly does have a contribution to the timbral component, uh, because of the, the number of harmonics different registers put into the equation. But really, a whole host of the changes that we hear have to do with acoustic uh, interactions. And people were unaware of that, and therefore, con uh, <clears throat> what's the word I want? Conflated? Conflated those two. So I believe there are laryngeal registers, just like we've always known, and that there are acoustic registers the laryngeal registers are more or less fixed in location. They have to do with muscle um, abilities. The acoustic registers are vowel-based because the resonances of each vowel are different. So the acoustic registers shift around depending on what vowel you're on. And so that's what makes it sort of complex and why I think they kind of muddy the water of, of what, what's going on registrationally. But I think if you realize and understand the acoustic registers and the laryngeal registers, then you can put it together and, and solve stuff and fix things. So there isn't a muscular adjustment that is completely distinct that we could call a middle register. But um, there, are acoustic, there, is, there are acoustic things going on all in that octave that create what I, I'm willing to call those registers. Here's why I'm willing to call acoustic registers registers. They have a similar sound or a stretch of the range on a, on a vowel, and they're caused by the same mechanical principle. It's just an acoustic principle, not a laryngeal principle. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that will ever be common, you know, commonly accepted. And I suppose I don't care <clears throat> whether people accept my uh, way of explaining it but they will have to accept the fact of the matter that those things happen. They name it however they want to call it. That's what happens. And uh, they have to come up with other names. If they don't want to call those registers, what are you going to call them? Uh, some people will say, well, let's call those registration and call registers the laryngeal things fine. That's fine. <laughs> no, you know, as long as you understand what's going on there and know, then know what to do in response to it, I don't care what you call it. Um, I call them acoustic registers and laryngeal registers in that they overlap and interact with each other and influence each other <clears throat> in very predictable ways once you understand them. And I'm always stressing this to my viewers and to my students that when I talk about registration, I'm not talking about registration in the strictest sense of the word in terms of it being exclusively related to, you know, the physiological events that happen, the physiological laryngeal events that take place, that I define it also as there being 
you know, an acoustical component because there are those interactions that I think, I think the voice science community is certainly acknowledging and now most, mostly the vocal pedagogy community is starting to right. understand a little bit more. And then as we continue to disseminate information, we're getting a lot more singers who are starting to get those light bulb moments where they're realizing that, oh, that's what's going on in my voice. I've wanted to know this all my life, right. why this is happening. And now I understand that there's an interaction between the physiological and the acoustical and that it's, it's an indisputable fact right. and that we need to work with that. We need to bring those two into a healthy coordinative relationship because if we don't, then we're really depriving ourselves, I think, of the opportunity to unify our scale and to, to really successfully navigate that passaggio area. One other thing, getting back to the question about what should women and men, for that matter, do through that, that passaggio area, in my experience, as a, just as a teacher in the studio, the more you allow the migrations to happen that need to happen, and you're making good shapes and you're motivating it with sincere communicative affect, you get more of the, of the tonal sensation, the acoustic sensation, more above the mouth and below the mouth and less just stuck in the mouth. Mm. In the lower middle voice and in lower, you get a very frontal mouth sensation. But as you go higher, this is where I, I do this epsilon thing. Um, <clears throat> depends on which way I'm facing is whether it's a three or an epsilon. But, you know, you, uh, where, where the sound migrates up and above and it settles down and below and it doesn't, and you're not widening the mouth trying to keep it in your mouth. You're letting it, oh, and, and you have to let it go, the have to let it migrate there right away. Every step up migrates. Mm -hmm. Don't try to keep the same exact sound vowel wise on any step up, let it migrate. Keep, keep the shape and insist on the feeling, you insist on the motivation and let it migrate right away. Because if you do, ah, uh, you're going to hit to the yell. They do, ah, 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 I wonder if you can hear that even in my <clears throat> coughed up voice. So you let it migrate right away. Wonderful. Any last things that you want to point out for the sake of the, or the benefit of the viewer? Oh, well, of course, you know, all this technical thought. Uh, in an ideal world, if there are no interferences and you're, you know, you're comfortable with yourself, singing is ultimately just expressing sincere, honest feeling and not doing funky stuff, letting, letting, letting the voice and the sensations migrate around and uh, good stuff can happen. But that's ultimately why we do this is to communicate things we feel deeply. So I can ask another question too, and this may not be very popular, <laughs> but considering that you're talking about sort of just letting the voice sort of coordinate, um, sort of prompted, inspired by emotion, affect, do you feel as though how we tend to approach active vowel modification has actually kind of done us a disservice mm -hmm. in some respects in terms of our being able to coordinate effectively throughout the entire range? Because there's been so much writing on the topic of vowel modification and, oh, we need to shade or lean the vowel this way. We need to allow this vowel to migrate and, or we need to lean it toward the next vowel, the next highest first form and frequency, whatever it might be. And do you think, think that we've kind of just tinkered a little bit too much and maybe overthought it? And now our bodies have lost that sort of intuitive cord, like coordinative response that we've just, because we've, we've tried to micromanage too many aspects of the scale. Well, um, I try not to be too hard on my predecessors or my colleagues because we all try and do the best we can. We're trying to help people right. see better. Um, <clears throat> and number one, number two, you, probably in most cases, I would agree with them uh, to some extent as to what the, the needed quality that needs to start coming into the sound. It's purely a matter of what's the best way, the simplest way, the most primal way to motivate that response from the singer. And I agree with you that active vowel modification, in my experience, uh, in my current opinion, is very much overused as the motivation for those. 
So I want, I, but I, but if a kid is really insisting on the yell response and somehow can't break themselves out of it, I will use active vowel modification to break them out of it as a step towards passive modification. I prefer not to go that route. I prefer to get it straight to passive, um, but sometimes their their history won't let that happen. And so, <clears throat> you know, I will, they're too programmed to raise the larynx and go, go divergent, and I'll just have them actively modify to make something happen to break it out of that pattern before I can get them to do it passively. But my yes. approach is very similar. I, I kind of really base my own approach on the individual student's needs and tendencies. Right. And there are some students who do need that. They okay, you know, bring a little bit of the urshness in there. Right. There are some students who need to okay, let that shade a little bit. <laughs> yeah, for the most part, I'm, I I kind of am in agreement with you in terms of letting it happen without overthinking it too much, and if it, you, if it can happen. Using um, an inflected <laughs> loop on a vowel, and if it's in a male, it'll stay in mode one. But if it's in a female, it can be in whoop, inflecting up and down. Usually you can get them to experience the, the migration more spontaneously and innately that way than singing it. So if they do a, oh, oh, okay, and they really have to motivate some sincere affect, oh, oh, eh, instead of chasing the vowel, eh, 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 me, uh, I don't, I've got to come up with a better word. <clears throat> Instead of chasing the vowel, make the affective journey. Make the expressive journey. Uh, oh, you know, <clears throat> I can't do much demonstrating today with this, what I've got left for a voice. But appreciate that, can be a very, that can be a very useful tool for them to, to, oh, the vowel really does migrate quite a bit. I didn't, you know. And if they're preoccupied with the feeling that they're expressing, they, they manage it, but it organizes more innately. Great. So hopefully this is helpful. It has been so fascinating. And again, I, I really am so appreciative of the time that you've taken out to answer our questions and, and just offer your expertise. It's been very, very fun. Great. Good to it's meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. <laughs> So thank you so very much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.